Hello and welcome to lecture number 28. This is topic 2.17, African Americans in Indigenous Territory. There is only one learning objective today. Explain how the expansion of slavery in the United States South affected relations between Black and Indigenous people. Some of the largest indigenous enslavers were what were called the five civilized tribes, which included the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole. This name was given to them by white Americans because of their efforts at assimilation into the rest of white American society. In order to continue that assimilation process, adopting slavery as a means of labor was utilized, and it was first encouraged by the U.S. Indian agent in the 1790s. It was quite profitable for the five civilized tribes, given that their territory in the southeast United States is where the cotton agriculture later flourished, in the state of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, and it was a forced land swap for these tribes. The federal government offered them land in Oklahoma, often a larger amount of land than they held in the southeast, to try and entice them to move and open up that land for white settlements in the southeast. After several years, the federal government forced the American Indian tribes to take the land swap, given that some members of the tribe signed a treaty with the federal government accepting it without the full consent of the rest of the tribe. By 1838, some of the last members of the Cherokee tribe were forcibly removed from their lands, and they took the enslaved African Americans with them. The number of people inside the five civilized tribes that owned or enslaved Africans was actually quite small. They constituted a tiny elite of the Indian society and were often of mixed American Indian and white descent, but they held disproportionate economic and political power within the tribe. This is why they continued to push for maintaining it as an institution inside the tribe. Out of the five civilized tribes, the Seminole Nation in Florida practiced slavery in a different way, sometimes described as a looser form of slavery than the rest. They adopted enslaved Africans as kin or family members who could not be sold to whites, and the status of slavery rarely passed down from the mother to the child. Additionally, they had a good relationship with Maroons or runaway enslaved people coming from South Carolina and Georgia into Florida. They provided shelter and refuge to these Maroons who were later known as Black Seminoles. The Black Seminoles paid a tribute to the Seminole Nation to continue to live there and have the protection in the form of crops or livestock. It's important to note that Florida was not a U.S. state or territory until 1821, and so therefore the Seminole were better able to engage in these acts of resistance against the United States or American planters. The Seminole were also the only of the five tribes to resist relocation with violence. They waged the Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. The total tribe numbered around 4,000 members, but they allied with the 800 Black Seminoles in the region. Black Seminole leaders like John Horse, sometimes referred to as Gopher John, also enlisted the help of rebellious plantation slaves to help repel the U.S. military. John Horse's legacy continued as he later moved to Mexico, where he served in the military and fought against further U.S. expansion. Before the Trail of Tears, the accounts of slavery inside the civilized tribes varied greatly. The conditions for enslaved people are generally described as better than those on white plantations. After the Trail of Tears, it seems the civilized tribes adopted a harsher form of slavery, possibly because of the new harsher territory in which they had to live, the profitability of cotton as a cash crop, or to continue trying to assimilate with white American institutions. After the Trail of Tears among the four tribes, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Cherokee, enslaved people made up anywhere between 14-18% to 18 of the total tribal population. Eventually, they adopted slave coats and created slave patrols to bolster the institution, assisted in recapturing enslaved black people and returning them to their enslavers, and even fought for the institution in the Civil War as they joined the Confederacy. The Emancipation Proclamation, issued in 1863, did not apply to enslaved black people in Indian Territory. Slavery continued to exist until the 13th Amendment in 1865 and further until 1866, when the Choctaw and Chickasaw finally freed those who were enslaved among them. The reason that it took until 1866 is because the tribes had essentially broken previous treaties with the United States by taking up arms against them during the Civil War. So, a new series of treaties, titled the Reconstruction Treaties of 1866, had to be negotiated and approved to determine the new relationship between the U.S. and these Indian tribes. As a provision in these treaties, the federal government demanded that the Chickasaw and Choctaw and the rest of the tribes free those who were enslaved inside their nations and give them full citizenship rights within the tribal nation. The impact of codifying racial slavery in indigenous nations was that it hardened racial lines. This had the same impact as codifying racial slavery in white society in the United States. 
future classifications for tribal members would be described as by blood or as freedmen. Even though both of these groups would technically be considered part of these tribes, it severed black indigenous kinship ties. It obviously made it more difficult to be treated like a family member when you have also been classified as a piece of property. It also eliminated recognition for mixed-race members of indigenous communities. There was quite a bit of interracial marriage and unions prior to these slave codes, and once the slave codes were passed, the room for nuance was made a lot smaller. After the Civil War, tensions between black freedmen and native tribes increased, especially as freedmen sought recognition and citizenship within the tribes. By the time of the next significant event of dispossession of land for American Indians, the Dawes Act of 1887, tribes resisted enrolling black freedmen as official members. This resistance had implications for these members of the tribe down the road because they were then unable to claim some of the services that were provided by the United States or promised by the United States to tribal members under government treaties. For the most part, freedmen often continued to live in the community, speak the language, and practice the same culture as the rest of the tribe, despite not having citizenship. Eventually, many of the freedmen moved away without gaining official recognition, meaning that there have been generations of freedmen descendants who are due these government services and have not been able to receive them. As recently as 2017, some tribes have started to make an effort to re-enlist or open up registration for people who are descendants of freedmen listed in the 1887 Dawes Rolls. For example, the Cherokee Nation amended its constitution in 2017 to include the descendants of the freedmen as full citizens, recognizing their historical and cultural significance. And finally, here's the recap. Slavery was adopted by the five largest indigenous nations of the Southeast. Of the five, the Seminole practiced a looser form of slavery in which enslaved people were treated as kin. After the Trail of Tears, slavery was hardened and fought for in the Civil War. The slave coats hardened the racial line and made it more difficult for freedmen and their descendants in this country. This history illustrates the complex relationship and significant impacts of slavery and assimilation policies on black and indigenous communities, shaping their interactions and legacies up to the present day. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, click the thumbnail on the screen. And if you would like more resources to help you study, you can visit apushlights.com slash afam. I wish you the best of luck with your studies, and I hope to see you back on the next lecture.